Alessandro. Ale, the short version. You are three. All right. Can you hear me? Yes? Cool. So welcome to the Algonauts Project 2023 challenge. My name is Ali Gifford. And before starting, I would like to thank everyone who actively participated to the challenge, our sponsors, and also CCN for once again hosting us. This year at CCN, there are two sessions dedicated to the Algonauts Project. The first session is today, and it consists in a short introduction to the challenge given by me followed by the core of the session, which consists of the talks from the top three challenge winners, moderated by Ben Lanner. And finally, it will conclude with a panel discussion moderated by Lucia Meloni, where Fabian Zintz, Gemma Roig, Martin Schrempf, and Radek Cihe will share their visions on challenges and also answer any of your questions, comments, or criticisms. Now. Martin Schrempf is still on his way here with a plane. He's been having some delays, so hopefully he will make it. Maybe he's going to join a bit later. We will see how the situation develops. And the second session is tomorrow morning from 10.45 a.m. until 12.30 p.m. in room 6. And it consists in a hackathon where you will learn how to model the challenge data using a new toolbox called net to brain and by doing so, we learn some really useful modeling skills that you can then use on your own projects. And if you decide to join, we would highly appreciate if you could already download the Hackathon's data beforehand through the QR code on the screen, or also through the links provided in the website, Hackathon's CCN website. I will be showing the screen, this slide again at the end, in case you didn't get the QR code. So let's start with what the Algonauts project is. The last decades have been characterized by the fruitful interaction between computer science and neuroscience, which resulted in breakthroughs in both fields of research. Neuroscientists gained state-of-the-art models, predictive models of the brain, which often also has been used to provide explanatory accounts of neural mechanisms. And on the other hand, computer scientists have gained state-of-the-art computer models which excel at many different tasks, from computer visions to playing video games, also often also surpassing human level performance. And in this same spirit, the Algonauts Project is a platform that aims at fostering further exchange of ideas and collaboration between biological and artificial intelligence researchers, so to accelerate scientific development in both fields. And although there are many different active areas of cooperation between neuroscience and computer science, in this year we decided to focus on the problem of how visual scene understanding is achieved in the human brain. This is because vision is an unresolved problem in the fields of both artificial and biological intelligence alike, and also one of the topics in which both fields have collaborated and advanced the most. We therefore tackled the problem of human visual intelligence with two main goals in mind. The first goal was to promote the development of cutting edge encoding models of the visual brain, where an encoding model is a model that takes an image as an input and outputs the corresponding brain response. And the second goal was to provide a common platform where the, um, the fields of computer science and neuroscience could efficiently interact and communicate while developing such models. And we believe that an effective way to achieve both of these goals was through a challenge. Challenges have been a popular and productive framework in both neuroscience and computer science, as they provide quantitative and objective scores of model development, while at the same time offering the opportunity for scientists of different disciplines to balance cooperation and competition during model building. Therefore, in this year's edition of the Algonauts Project Challenge, we ask participants to build encoding models that best predict the brain's responses to images. Now, encoding models require considerable amounts of data to properly train. And because of this, we based the challenge on the largest data set of neural responses available, the Natural Scenes data set, in short, NSD. 
And NSD is a large-scale fMRI data set collected at the University of Minnesota, and it consists of fMRI responses to 73,000 different images across eight subjects, where all of these images came from the COCO database and consisted of naturalistic color scenes. For the challenge, we used pre-processed fMRI responses of all eight NSD subjects that have been projected onto a common cortical surface template. Cortical surface templates are composed of vertices, which are individual points on this surface. And the challenge data consisted of a portion of vertices overlying visual cortex that were maximally responsive to visual stimulation. Here you can see these, these vertices in purple. And during the challenge, participants were invited to use their encoding models to predict the visual responses, the responses of these vertices to images. Now, model building requires independent data splits for training and testing models. The train split is used to fit the parameters of the model, while the test split is used to see whether the fitted model learned to generalize its performance beyond the train split. And because of this, we partition the challenge data into non-overlapping train and test splits. The train split came from the publicly released NSD data and it consisted of 9,500 unique images per subject along with the corresponding fMRI responses. And subjects, participants, were asked to use these, this data to train their encoding models. Well, the test split came from the withheld portion of NSD and consisted of around 250 images per subject, of which, again, the responses were, the fMRI responses were withheld, and challenge participants had to use their train encoding models to predict the brain responses for these hidden images. To quantify the prediction accuracy of the participants' encoding models, we predicted, we compared their, um, their submitted fMRI responses for the test images to the withheld fMRI responses for the same test images. We performed this co comparison by correlating the fMRI predicted responses with the withheld responses independently for all vertices of all subjects and squared the resulting correlation scores to get the percentages of brain variance explained by the models at each vertex. We then normalized these explained variance scores by division with the maximal theoretical explainable variance the noise ceiling. And finally, we averaged the resulting normalized scores over all vertices of all subjects, obtaining the challenge evaluation metric, which reflected the portion of brain variance that could be accounted, that actually was accounted by the models. For example, a noise ceiling normalized our square score of 40% indicates that this given model accounted for 40% of the total explainable variance. Along with the challenge data, we also provided an interactive development kit tutorial on Google Colab, which illustrates how to load and interpret and visualize the challenge data. Use this data to train and test vanilla encoding models of the visual brain and prepare the predictions in the right format for submission. Besides serving as an aid to the Algonauts challenge, this interactive tutorial can also be used for educational learning purposes for example, as an introduction to fMRI data or to encoding models. The challenge ran from January 14th until July 26th, and it was hosted on CodaLab, where after each submission, the leaderboard was updated in real time, so to provide feedback, rapid feedback, in terms of how the model development is progressing. And the challenge also came with some rules. First of all, to limit overfitting to the withheld test split, we limited the amount of total daily and overall submissions of each team. Second, we forbid training models on any neural response for the test images. And third, to promote open science and allow the entire community to benefit from the challenge, we made it mandatory for the participants to share their report and code if they wanted to be considered for the winner's process. So if you're interested in understanding or implementing this model yourself, you will find the reports and the code used by the challenge teams in our website, via links in the challenge website. 
We observe an increase in interest and participation compared to the previous two editions of the challenge. We received submissions from 106 teams coming from both neuroscience and computer science research groups, which is a six-fold increase compared to the 2021 edition of the challenge and a four-fold increase compared to the 2019 edition of the challenge. However, we suspect that the numbers are slightly inflated as we think that around 20 of these teams are duplicates which were used to increase the amount of total possible submissions. Now, this is a problem inherent to many challenges in neuroscience, which might be addressed at the end of the session during the panel discussion, if you as public are interested in this topic. Despite this, these numbers suggest that there's a growing interest between the fields of neuroscience and computer science to interact in tackling the unresolved problem of intelligence. The CodeLab submission page also came with a forum where we received lively feedback from the challenge participants. Over the course of the challenge period, we exchanged 70 messages across 13 threads, which resulted in a fruitful interaction between participants and organizers, which led to significant improvements to the challenge. And now let's look at the challenge results. This is a histogram with the submission's prediction accuracies on the x-axis and the vertical dashed line corresponds to our baseline encoding model, which was based on an AlexNet train on object classification. And these are the result scores of all challenge participants. 51 submissions, about half of them, result in an improvement in prediction accuracy compared to our baseline model. And the top models accounted for more than 60% of explainable variance. And we then selected the three teams with the highest prediction accuracy scores as the challenge winners. Here you will see the prediction accuracy of the winning models on a flattened brain surface map. This map corresponds to the two hemispheres, left hemisphere and right hemisphere, and the annotations show different areas over the visual cortex. Since the challenge only uses a portion of vertices, the ones overlaying visual cortex, I will only show these vertices to you. First place, with a challenge score of 70.85%, is Team Jose. Once again, this single score represents the noisily normalized square correlation average across all model vertices of all subjects, reflecting the percentage of explainable variance which had been accounted for by the models. Second place, with a score of 63.52%, is Team Hossein Adeli. And third place, with a score of 61.57% is team URKSUNY Albany. Their models result in a state of the art predictions for the entire visual cortex from retinotopic areas and early visual cortex to category selective areas along the ventral screen, thus fulfilling the first challenge goal, which was to promote development of cutting edge encoding models of the visual brain. And furthermore, these three winners, along with the other challenge participants, came from a mixture of computer science and neuroscience research groups, thus fulfilling the second challenge goal, which was to provide a common platform where the field of biological and artificial intelligence can interact in developing such models. Now, given that these models resulted in state-of-the-art predictions for the visual brain, a very interesting question would be to know how the same model would generalize out of distribution, as this would strengthen their validity and robustness as models of the brain. And to answer this question, we used a hidden portion of NSD called NSD Synthetic, which consists of one session of fMRI responses to 220 artificially generated monochromatic stimuli of different categories from white noise to spiral gratings. And we therefore asked the three challenge winners to use their same winning models to predict the responses to these synthetic stimuli, which we then compared again through correlation with the real fMRI responses. The model of Team Huse had a score of 36.80%, and in gray are the previous prediction accuracies for the official test split as a comparison. The model of Team Hossein Adeli had a score of 32.24%, and the model of Team UARC SUNY Albany had a score of 33.91%. Now, the winning models accounted for 30% of explainable brain variance for NSD synthetic, which is about half of the variance that they explained for the official test split. 
However, although this is a considerable gap in prediction accuracy between the two data splits, the two winning models could still will generalize the predictions to images from a very different distribution from the ones they were trained on. And especially for early and mid-level visual areas such as retinotopic cortex. So the parts in these plots which are more red. And this out of distribution generalization strengthens the validity and robustness as models of the visual brain. As you will learn from the talks by the challenge winners, besides the input images, some of these winning models also exploited behavioral responses and experimental design, such as the order with which images were presented during the NSD experiment, to predict brain responses. Using this additional information did help in explaining additional brain variants, but also raises important and exciting questions on data analysis and modeling efforts, such as which portion of brain variants should we consider as signal that we're interested in and we want to model, as opposed to noise, which is uninteresting to us and we should disregard? Or more in general, what should we as a community consider as satisfying models of the brain? And once again, if you're interested in these questions, please, or similar questions, we will discuss them during the panel discussion at the end of the session. Although the official challenge is now over, we're hosting a post-challenge phase on Coda Lab, which also has its own leaderboard. This post-challenge phase has no deadline, and you can use it to test the, your, the prediction accuracy of your latest encoding models of the visual brain. This challenge would not have been possible without the unprecedented size and quality of NSD. Up to now, the last three NSD, NSD core scan sessions from which the challenge uh, test split came from were withheld. However, since the challenge is now over, we're happy to announce that this data has been released and is now available to the entire community. So you can visit it through the following QR code or the link, I'm sure you're aware of NSD. And looking forward to the future, we aim it to host the next Algonauts Challenge in 2025. And for this edition, we're planning to make a shift from how vision is processed in the brain to how language is processed in the brain, which is made possible thanks to recent large-scale data collection efforts of natural language processing in a human brain. For example, Uri Hasson and collaborators recently collected a ma massive data set of intracranial EEG of patients listening to podcasts while they were at the hospital. However, this is still a plan which, among other things, also depends on funding. So if you have any ideas about the next Algonas project, or if you have data, or you know about data that could be used for it, or if you would like to help organizing it, we, are well, we warmly welcome any type of feedback, ideas, help, or data. And to conclude, I would like to once again thank the challenge organizers for making this possible, all people and teams who participated actively in the challenge, sponsors, and CCN for hosting us once again. We will now move to the core of the session where the top three challenge winners will tell you first why they participated in the challenge and then tell you about their winning models, which will be followed by a panel discussion on challenges in neuroscience. And finally, in tomorrow's hackathon, you will learn how to model the challenge data using a new toolbox called net to brain And if you decide to participate, please do download the data already in advance. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Ale. Um, my name is Ben Lahner. I'm a PhD student at MIT, and I was one of the organizers for Algonauts. Um, so now we're going to hear from the top three winning teams, uh, going from the third place to the second, and finally our first place team. And they're going to have a 12-minute talk, and then we're going to leave three minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, so first, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Shuan Nguyen, representing the third place team from UARC Sunny Albany. And he's going to be joining us on Zoom. And Juan is a PhD student studying at the University of Arkansas under Professor Koalu. And Juan has a strong computational or strong computer science background, building computational models of perception 
and the team used this expertise to score 61.6 in the Algonauts Challenge. Uh, so please welcome Juan um, to tell us more about his team's approach. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Juan Bak. I am a PhD student at the University of Arkansas. On the behalf of team today, I'm happy to present our solution of the Angular channel. So first of all, let's talk about our motivation that we uh, join the channel. First of all, I would say the channel objective is very interesting and is well aligned with our research directions. Um, we believe that understanding the human brain may benefit to the next generation of neural network design. So uh, that are the main reason we decided to join the competition. Um, our solution is pretty simple and straightforward. There are three major things that contribute to the final results overall. So first of all, it's about the training strategies. Um, in our solution, we have a two training staff. The first one is the pre-training and uh, the second one is the fine-tuning. Secondly, we adopt the correlation loss function to optimize the models we have to improve the uh, evaluation metric overall. Finally, uh, we employ the ensemble uh, methods that we combine different models, different backbone, we train on the various settings uh, to get better results. Our single model achieved 57%, uh, while ensemble results uh, achieved around 61.5% uh, uh, approximately. You can find the code in the GitHub link below. Right, so let's talk about the pre-training step. So in this training step, we use on the subject data. So the input of uh, the model is a single image. We, we pass it through the neural network and to get the image features. Uh, the model learns to predict the full uh, brain signal. However, keep in mind that uh, there as is the sharing image between the subject. So if the model uh, learned in this scenario, it may get, uh, it may be get confused. So in order to overcome this problem, we propose to use a subject ID as the input features. In particular, uh, we employ the neural embedding model that is provided by the Python to get the, uh, uh, to get the subject features. And we believe that the one hot encoding also work well in this scenario. So uh, basically, we have uh, two uh, features. One, the image features. Second one is the uh, subject features. We combine them together by concatenation operation and fit into two separate uh, fully connected layers to predict half uh, hemisphere functional MRI and also right hemisphere functional MRI. So after the pre-training step, uh, then we take the uh, backbone that already pre-trained uh, for the fine tuning. So similarly, um, uh, the inputs in the single images, and we use the individual subject data only. So this means that we don't uh, need the uh, the subject features. Uh, 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 in this training step, models uh, are trained to learn uh, and predict the individual uh, ROI signal alongside with the brain signal. And uh, overall, the final predictions uh, is an uh, average of uh, ROI signal and uh, full signal. Uh, in this session, I would talk about the loss functions. Uh, in this channel base, uh, uh, I think there's many loss functions can be applied uh, in this training. So, uh, for example, L1 loss or root mean square loss. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, in evaluation metric, we uh, compute the correlation score of the predicted signal and um, uh, the and the grouches. And there's loss functions 
uh, could not optimize uh, this this call as well. So by this reason, we implement the Pearson correlation based load function to optimize the correlation load. Uh, the implementation is pretty, uh, pretty uh, easy. Uh, so uh, the correlation load function that I, man I already mentioned in the previous slide, not, reflect uh, not reflecting exactly the evaluation matrix of the channels because uh, the, the matrix, uh, they compute the normal nine means of the correlation across the ROI, hemisphere, and subject. By this reason, we in implement the mean normalized correlation loss at below. We have to optimize the evaluation metric directly. Uh, however, I think there's one of limitation in this uh, loss function is that uh, this loss function computes uh, within a mini batch only. So uh, it's showing the local optimal of the uh, overall uh, evaluation metric. However, if we assume that we have a very large elapsed back size, uh, this function can um, can reflect how the matrix of the systems as well. Uh, regarding to the experiment setting and hyperparameter settings uh, for the input images, uh, we resize the image into the 448 by 448 pixels. Uh, we did try with the different kind of um, residing with the different size of image, uh, even uh, higher or lower, we found that uh, uh, 448 was the best in our scenario. In both the training and API training and the file tuning step, we split data into the file flow randomly uh, and doing the uh, k for cross validation scenario. Uh, it's important to note that we, we didn't use any augmentation methods because we found whenever we add uh, even very easy, uh, simple uh, augmentation like horizontal flip, rotation, and so on, uh, we found a huge drop uh, in the performance. So we just give uh, the image resizing and normalization, uh, kind of very simple. Um, we train the model using the ADAM optimizers, uh, practice more learning rate, and uh, learning rate is uh, trained uh, by the cosine linear scheduler. Uh, we train whole the system uh, within uh, trail epochs with early stopping, and usually um, I stop after six epochs, and it took me around uh, four to five hours to train one model uh, per, uh, per subject. Uh, in in the research session, we investigate how the training staff and the loss function have to improve the performance overall. So we found that the, for the pre-training, uh, it had to improve 2.2%. Uh, uh, in the meantime, the loss functions, uh, like correlation loss function, have to improve 0.5%. In addition, we also tried with many, many backbones, like uh, vision transformer, efficiency, and so on. And um, uh, we found that convolution net family models, uh, especially the convolution net picture logs, was the best in our framework, our scenario. So for the more details of the result, you can see in the report paper. All right, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. I'm sorry. What happens if we remove the subject branch, the branch that encodes the subject number? How does that impact accuracy? Uh, you mean in the pre-training step? Yeah, in the pre-training step. Uh, all right. Thanks for your questions. Um, uh, all right, so because we have a uh, image sharing between our cross subject, so it means that there are some uh, image overlap, and uh, it means that uh, with the same signals, uh, when the, uh, with the same input, uh, input image, but we have a different brain support 
brings response for the uh, of the subject. Uh, so when the model train uh, with those kind of data, uh, this uh, consider like the noisy uh, signal. So um, uh, if we remove the subject ID features, uh, probably the model will get noise and perform gross uh, overload. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, thank you for the presentation. What What is the size of the model that you use? Did you reduce the, the dimension of the layers or did you use the original uh, model? Uh, we just use uh, the original models uh, from the public training, uh, uh, public models. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's already pre-trained on the email okay. okay, thank you. All right, let's give one more round of applause for Swan. Thank you. Thank you. All right, for the next speaker, we have Hussein Adeli representing Team Hussein Adeli. And Hussein is a postdoc at Columbia, uh, New York, with Nicholas, Krie in Nicholas Krieger's Quartz Lab. And Hussein has a strong computational neuroscience background, uh, researching visual cognition and attention. So he and his team use this interdisciplinary background to leverage a transformer architecture to achieve a second place score of 63.5. So please welcome Hussein to tell us more about his team's submission. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> so I want to first start by talking a little about why we participated in the challenge. So a belief that is shared by a lot of people in this room is that, and, and we really strongly believe in that, is that deep neural networks provide us a, a computational uh, language to form these hypotheses about different brain mechanisms. Um, these Hypotheses could differ in their architecture, in their uh, diet of the data that they get, in their learning objectives. But in order to really extract insights from these models, we need robust ways to compare them with brain activity, with behavioral data, in order to really adjudicate among them. Now, Algonaut provides this opportunity to take out a really strong bias out of our modeling practice, which is accessing the test data. By, by withholding that test data, you really uh, prevent this bias to, to creep into your analysis. Um, also, the reason we participate is that because the development kit, the tutorials, the uh, uh, different uh, videos that they were made were very well put together. Like, it really made this very easy. So I recommend to people to really check out the tutorials, even if you're not interested in the challenge itself. Um, yeah, for these reasons, we participated, and we think this is an important initiative. So to our approach, there is a recipe for predicting neural activity, which is, well, you have an image or other sensory modality. You, you convert that. You encode that in certain features. Then you take those features and you map them to fMRI or other neural activity. Now, it stands to reason that what you use to encode would be the best performing computer science model. It would be CNNs or uh, transformers or an ensemble of models. However, these are large dimension, you know, networks with a lot of features. So a lot of people would use PCA or other approaches to reduce the dimensionality. Then you would read, uh, uh, train a regression on top of that and get neural activity. We are using also a transformer encoder for encoding the features. But the area that is a little underexplored is this mapping between features and neural activity, right? Instead of regression, can we explore other ways to do this, and can we actually learn that mapping? This seems to be the right time to do it because of the availability of larger scale data, uh, including NSC data set, uh, which Algonauts is, is based on. So first with the encoder, we used a vision transformer, a VIT, and just to refresh your memory, it's shown on the right. 
an image is uh, divided into patches, different patches are uh, encoded with feature representation, and over multiple layers of encoding, each patch is uh, contextualizing its response by attending to all the other patches that it finds relevant. And that's what's called self-attention. You could train such a model for classification, but you could also train such a model with uh, self-supervised for reconstruction, for distillation, for other purposes. And what we use is a model called uh, Dino, which is distillation with no labels. And in this model, you basically have different variations of the same image, and you want to make sure they have the same uh, representation. So that allows the model, kind of forces the model to capture the essence of the image. So it's self-supervised. The reason we selected this backbone is because in earlier work, we were modeling the uh, dynamics of object grouping, and we created these constructs called affinity maps, which basically looks at the uh, activity, the representation of one patch, and compares it with the, all, the, all the other patches. And we wanted to say, okay, a good representation should be object-centric, meaning, meaning that patches that have similar representation should be on the same object. And we, dis we basically compared a lot of models. What we found was that uh, Dino version 2, which is a variation on Dino, with a VIT base model, uh, which is a 12-layer encoder, and patch size of 14 works best. So that is our backbone. On the decoder side, right, mapping these representations to fMRI activity, we are, we are taking inspiration from a model called DETR. And in this model, basically, it's trained for object detection. So on the decoder side, you basically have different queries. In this case, they represent different objects. So, and they're learnable embeddings. They could specialize in detecting maybe large objects or objects that are in a corner or specific things. And they attend to different parts of the, through this key query mechanism, they attend to different parts of, parts of the encoder in order to basically detect a certain object. Putting all of this together, we could get a model like this, where we basically have an image, we divide it into patches, and if you need, you have to pad it a little bit so it fits the patch sizes. We feed these image patches, we go through many layers or multiple layers of the encoder, in this case it's 12. We could get the visual input from one of these encoder layers, which is say about 31 by 31, these are the number of patches, and the, the, the feature dimension of each patch is around 768 in this case. You feed that to the decoder. On the decoder side, you use queries that correspond to different brain areas, the different regions of interest that you're interested to predict. And that query basically attends to the visual features it find relevant, then that is linearly mapped onto the visual representation of that specific area. Here, we, we decided to have models taking input from different layers of the encoder, but why would we want that? Theoretically, we would have expected that if the input comes from earlier layers of the encoder, it would be better for the decoder to be able to predict early visual areas, because we, we expected this hierarchy of representation kind of map, and this is exactly what we found. Here, I'm showing the best model performance, like uh, where the, which encoder layer was used, their representation in order to predict each of them. And you could see these are the view, posterior view of the brain. And you could see there is this gradedness that the decoder can predict the voxel better if it's looking uh, in the early visual areas, if it's looking at the early layers of the encoder. So we see this graded abstraction of representation in our encoder. So we basically combine the responses from these different models. We also have a post-processing step where we try to reduce the dimensionality and try to basically take advantage of uh, dependencies among the voxels. Um, and we add a little behavioral responses here. These are in core to our model. We just added it at the end to get a little bit boost. Um, but look at the code if you're interested. Now putting it all together, and this is the courtesy of the organizers actually generating this, uh, we get a score of around 63.5, and this is the view um, based on the performance. We didn't use any sorts of dependencies in terms of time and, and whatnot, but, but it would be interesting to also look at those factors. If you look at them, would we be able to improve our performance or not? Now, having told you this story, so I want to tell you what do we gain when we go from regression to these sorts of transformer-based mapping from representation 
to the visual, uh, to the fMRI activity. And what we can get actually are attention maps, right? Just, just to refresh your memory, this is the multi-head attention basically is attending each query, basically each regions of interest, you have a query, and it's attending to different parts of the visual encoder in order to predict the response. So now we could actually plot those attention maps. This shows the attention weights from a query on, uh, that was predicting the V1V on the left hemisphere. So what would it attend to? Well, in this case, it's attending to this quadrant of the visual input. This is remarkable. We did not do any receptive field mapping in this model. This is all data driven. The fact that this query eventually has to predict the brain activity of this area makes it basically attend to this part of the visual input. Let's look at some face selective regions. Similarly, we see that when, when queries are basically trained to only predict certain uh, face selective areas, the attention emerges looking at the face in the image. Again, no, we're not doing any receptive field mapping or anything. Um, we could look at body selective areas and see what the attention signal is there. Or we could look at the place selective areas and we see attention is more distributed that way. Um, we could look at other face examples and you could see it even works for animal faces or, uh, or person face above. I even though there are much more salient stuff in these scenes, you could see that um, a query that is supposed to uh, predict the FFA1 or FFA2 um, is attending to this specific region of the uh, image, which, which you find remarkable because, again, no, no mapping. Like, it, it gives us the idea that maybe we could do this in a data-driven way. If you define an anatomical area and then train this model, you could see which area this, this query attended to and find the selectivity of that anatomical area. So transformers in this work help us in three ways. Uh, one, encoding. We believe that transformers that are trained with self-supervised objectives uh, deserve consideration as models of visual representation in the brain. Um, and, and we approach this both in this case with the neural data, but in prior work in terms of grouping and attention. Mapping to brain activity. I think we think transformers, aside from working better, they could give us uh, a, a more elegant way of going from neural activity, from features to neural activity. And, and as I showed, they really increase the interpretability and, and in a way that they allow us to discover selectivity in a data-driven manner, in a way that, well, if I have an anatomical area, then I could potentially find out what concepts are maximally activating this area. Well, for future direction, I think we need more data. I think NSD is a great starting point, but I think it would be nice to have 10 or 50 folds more data in order to train these models and have many more layers. And, and in a way, if, if we really want to take advantage of the data-driven approach, I think we should, we should have more data. Um, we should try different backgrounds. I think we, we tried self-supervised one, but we could also try uh, vision language alignments. I think those are also in strong backgrounds. We should better quantify the segmentation, uh, using segmentation maps, quantify this attention and see what the selectivity is. Um, and I'll leave, leave you with one last thought. Maybe the way we think about areas of the brain communicating, we could update that to think about maybe an area has this gated way of communicating with other cells in a way that the encoder and decoder are communicating here. But, but that's just a thought and, and very forward looking. But, but I think it's an interesting thought to have. With that, I thank you and my collaborators. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yep. Hello. So do you think uh, which of the uh, parts of the VIT, for example, is the architecture more important or is the uh, self supervised losses uh, that is trying to predict uh, obs obscured patches, uh, col coloring, and that is more important for, for it to learn more uh, important representations? So is the loss function more important or the uh, 
have you tried and or the architecture more salient? So we, we tried this with different, so if, if we let's say use change the objective instead of, in this case being distillation with, with reconstruction, we would get similar input. I, th I think as long as, long as it's a self-supervised thing, like in supervision, as we know, kind of abstracts over a lot of representation, but when you use self-supervised or unsupervised methods, if whatever you want to call it, they, they maintain a lot of more of the information. If you, if you need to reconstruct the object, then you would have to maintain the information. Architecture is very important. I think um, what we saw in prior work, um, the transformer-based architecture works a lot better with, say, self-supervised methods than a convolution does. So it's just, it's just all sorts of things have to come together for it to give you this nice object-centric representation that could eventually give you better prediction power. Thanks, great talk. Um, do you have a sense of what scale of data you need for the transformer mapping to be successful? Like with a run-of-the-mill cognitive neuroscience experiment, would that work? Probably not. I mean, so we are training these models per subject. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we have around 9,000 images for each subject, and we have the data for them. I would say, and again, we, we have to simplify our model a lot in terms of even for that data set. So I would say you probably need that scale of images. But with the, other, like with the other project that I was talking about earlier, there we're not training beyond the initial point. So I think if you start from a pre-trained transformer, it gives you enough features that you could come up with a creative way of using it without retraining. In this case, we train the decoder on the data. So. But in that case, would you still be able to get those attention maps? Uh, probably not, yeah. So in that case, you probably would want, because the decoder, so you have to train a decoder in order to attend to the right way, yeah. Okay, very cool work, thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I have one more question. So if I understand correctly, your, you have, um, your model has one branch for each ROI and they do not overlap. What do you think will happen, will happen if you had, um, if your linear layer were to uh, predict um, vertices that overlap between ROIs? So uh, th there are different ways of defining the queries. If we do, uh, for example, streams, so you could have for different streams and stuff, they would overlap a little bit. But, but we haven't tried really overlapping this stuff, but I know what you, so that's an interesting point. I, yeah, we haven't tried that. Because you would end up with some sort of like ensemble model in the sense that you would have several predictions maybe yeah. for voxels which overlap between, and, and I was just surprised, like I, would, I was just wondering what happens at the intersection of ROIs maybe. Sorry. That's interesting, we haven't looked at it. We haven't looked at it. Cool. Great, let's give uh, one last round of applause for us in. All right, so our final speaker uh, is Jose from Team Jose. And Jose is a PhD student from the University of Pennsylvania, where he's co-advised uh, by James Guy and Gian Boshi. And Jose's work spans both compu uh, computer vision and neuroscience, um, where he has a strong research background modeling brain activity with neural networks. And so he used his expertise to develop a clever memory encoding model that achieved an impressive first place score of 70.8. 8%. So please welcome Jose, the winner of the Algos 2023 challenge, to the stage to learn more about his approach. Uh, sorry, I need more time. Uh, can you see my screen? Is this seen? Yeah, yes, works. Thank you. So, uh, besides this mysterious 17 score on the leaderboard, I have more weird stuff to show you. Uh, let's get started. So, my biggest motivation for is this challenge is just because it's fun. Like, I was just racing for a higher score because why not? It's an open challenge we are using the same test set. And also, we are using the same metric, the quantitative comparison. 
And the biggest part is that we have an active community, like 100 people working on this. It's the leaderboard is like a tsunami pushing everyone forward. And I won't even try this crazy stuff if there's no such leaderboard. So thanks, everyone. So at the end of the day, how is our best model? Before I flood you with this plot, let's make sure everyone is on the same page. So I will be using the plot on the right side, but it's basically the one on the left side flattened out. You can see how V1 is on the center of the right side uh, cortex plot. And on the top, we have the noise seeding uh, provided by the NSD. And on the bottom, I have a baseline model of 60. And the input is only one image. Then we have the memory encoding model. In, we have additional input with memory, which is just previously presented 32 images and behavior, which is a bottom press and time information. If we compare this to the noise seeding, you will notice that this, this blue spot, this white spot, sorry, they're not noise, they're predictable. The whole cortex, known visual brain, the prediction score is about 0 0.1. So what's happening here? If we divide, uh, subtract this memory encoding model with baseline, you can see here darker blue means more improvement. On V1, there's nearly no, little to no improvement, but on the known visual brain, there's this big improvement. And next, I will work through an overview of my model. The input is four part. First is the image content. That's what everyone else is using. And we also use the spatial coordinates of these voxels. And then that's the behavior data as conditional vectors. And also the memory images. The bottom half of this model is shared by all these voxels in one ROI. And it's fine tuned, not, not frozen. And the top part, we have a unique linear regression for each of these model, uh, voxel, sorry. And also the input feature for each of these voxels is half shared. Uh, I mean, the blue part is controlled by the coordinates of this voxel. This makes them half shared. So let's first jump in the first part. Why are we using the coordinates? So the motivation is that spatially close uh, voxels in the brain, they should have similar functionality. Like ROI, V1 to V3, or face selective, body selective regions, they are spatially close. So if we take a look at the reading anatomy or the receptive field mapping, you will notice the image is upside down and a flipped image on the brain. And we can take this to our advantage. Like we build a retina mapper, which takes the physical coordinates input, the 3D voxels coordinates on the brain, and use the MLP to map it to the 2D coordinates on this image. And uh, th this was originally inspired by the sensorial computation, but we made two improvements. First is we use positional embedding on the input to extract feature from multiple frequency band. And also we use tangent activation function on the output to make sure this mapped 2D coordinate doesn't fall out of bound. And the learned optimized retina mapper looks something like this. You can see the left hemisphere, dorsal stream is the purple scene, is mapped to the uh, lower right of this image. And the gray st spots, the high level ROIs are mapped to the center. The, uh, besides this receptive field location mapping, we also have receptive field size difference in the brain based on these coordinates. So we also build this, uh, lucky for us, the CNN, the feed forward network, they also have this small to large receptive field going from deep shallow to deep layer. So we also build this layer selector, which also takes the physical coordinates as input, use an MLP with softmax activation function to select layers for each of this voxel. So putting these things together, on the left, I have the retina mapper, and on the right, I have the layer selector. This video shows how they are learned during training. I have four colors here. These are four layers. The red is the first layer. V1 is selecting the first layer. And on the left side, you can see the red span the whole image uh, space. And high level voxels, the blue and pink, they are centered on the left. I also have another example from the second subject. And Another example from the third subject, you can see how they keep this shape and first layer always is selected by the early visual cortex. And 
this turn into a performance score, we see a big performance score input on the early video, but as things go to high level video, the score increase, in, increase is smaller. And on the non visual brain, we see no score increase because they are like mapped to the center. And I also apply this to other data sets. Like during the first half of this challenge, I was trying to win this by brute force, just include more training data. And I collected all these data sets from other uh, sources. And I apply this retina mapper. And on NSD, this looks beautiful, but on other data sets, it doesn't look like it's learning anything. It's just mapping everything to the center. And my attempts of brute force fail, so that's why I try this crazy stuff afterwards. And let, second, let's look, take a look at how we add conditional vector or the behavior data. So I have two branches for this behavior data. Left is image related and right is image unrelated. So the motivation for image related part is that when we saw this image, for the first time we saw it, my attention turned to span the whole image, like both the object and the background. And the second time, I just focus on the object itself but ignore the background, so that's related to image. And for the image unrelated part, for example, the bottom press of using this finger on this motor cortex should have nothing to do with this image content. And it turned into a two-point submission score boost just by having this behavior data. Next, let's look at this previous image compression module. We have past 32 images. And the idea is simple, just compress them into a 1D feature vector that contains 32 images. But we need to be careful, because the 32 images, is, they are ordered. Like the first and the last image encoded different in the brain, and the model needs some way to know about this ordering. So here, I have the input, uh, previous image content, and previous behavior, and the time of this image, which thought it come from. And I have a blue time shared MLP for all these 32 images, but the MLP knows which time it is by having this time input. And I repeat this blue MLP for all these 32 images and use another yellow MLP to compress it into a feature vector. And it's resulting in a four point score in, in submission score increase by just having these previous 32 images. Next, next, let's take a closer look. Is that really just previous images? Is that really just simple? No, that's, it's more complicated. It's related to experiment design and data preprocessing. Let's take a closer look. So on the right side, I have this video from NSD experiments, swing captures, speed up four times. But you can see there's a blank trial every eight to 14 trials. I will use these colorful emojis to represent trials and a blank and images. Did you notice something when watching this video on the right side? Are you counting these trials and expecting the next blank? Yeah, so we, when we build a model with these previous 32 images, including this blank, we get a prediction score that looks like this. A whole brain is predictable. And let's try something interesting. What if we remove all this image content, replace it with a dummy thing, and only keep the information about this blank? It's still able to predict something. A new model is zero. And let's remove this blank, and we get a lower prediction score. Let's try more. Uh, what I call here time shifting model is that let's start with a normal model that make a pair of this image and bring on current time what t equals zero. That's the current model, and we can shift this pair. Like we can pair bring with past image that's t minus one, and we can shift more t minus two. And Hosan see me do this and come to me and says, why don't you make a model that use future image? Okay, why not? And once we shift this, we get a score like this. On the left side is a past model, on the right side is future model. I know there's weird things happening here, but let's just keep focus on the zero to negative 32 frames at this time. There is a periodicity going on here as if this image is reappearing. But let's try something interesting. What if we remove all this image but only keep the blank? The periodicity is still there, but the current image has no prediction power because there's no image content. But the periodicity happened with this blank. And let's try more. What if we remove this blank? The periodicity is gone. But did you notice something strange? Yes, there's a prediction power on t plus one, the future image, and it's even bigger than t minus one. So after this challenge, we fine tune our best model to include the feature frame, and we get another two point submission score boost to 72. 
Yep. So that's my model, at least the interesting, most important thing I want to show with you. So what's the takeaway? The first is written attribute module or the layer selector capturing receptive field size and the retina mapper capturing receptive field location. And the second thing is memory. So the past 32 image or the past images, it got to be somewhere in the brain, but we need to be more careful. There's this blank and time experiment design thing and there's also the data purposes and potentially have an impact. And lastly, I just want to say that on the surface, it's, there is this cool stuff, but under the water, there's this trial and errors. I, so I picked up the coolest thing to show you in this talk, but just ask me this question. I'm happy to answer even. Just shoot me a quick email. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I'm curious about your layer selector. So you say as an MLP with softmax, I guess you have as many outputs as layers, and then you do you select a particular layer or you do just make a weighted sum over the different layers, like weighted by softmax, or how does it exactly work? I didn't get that. Uh, you mean the softmax? Let me dig it up. So. Um, basically, it's just um, you can like take f different layer as feature input for these, these voxels. But the way I do it is I sum these four layers with a weight. This weight is optimized by this MLP and softmax. So if in an extreme case, it's, there will only be zero 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 one is selecting the last layer. But there's some smooth case like in the intermediate layers. It's just like an average of these four layers. Okay, so you, you do you do a weighted average, and do you um, uh, have you looked at the softmax output? So it's basically yeah. does it increases for increasing depth in the brain. If yes, you, uh, that's in our paper. You can check it out. That's this this one shows this argmax of this softmax, but actually before argmax is soft. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Uh, how did you use the memory in the te on the test set? Do you have the time series in the test set? Yes, we, I dig it up in the original NSDX repository. We do have the order of this image presented. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> That's a quick stuff. It's a trick. That's nice. Thanks for the great talk. I think it's uh, interesting how you were able to use so many different data modalities to in increase predictions outside of visual cortex. Uh, I'm curious how, how much implication you think this has for representations of vision in the brain, because it seems like there's a lot of information being pulled into this representation that most people traditionally don't uh, associate with visual representation. And uh, I wonder if there's there's more to be explored here and how much these additional data modalities uh, filter into the perceptual representation because uh, what, what I think your work shows is that those are important as well and while traditional vision encoders like we've seen a lot of great stuff, the last presentation was about a transformer feature encoder, do you think that there is a place for uh, like more advanced feature embedders like transformers both in your architecture but also to, to combine with these more extensive data modalities? Uh, what do you mean by data modality, like image and text? Uh, image or text or these additional position embeddings, the, the behavior data that you integrated and all these other uh, additional data points that helped improve the predictions of your model. I see. So a traditional way is that we try to use GRM, Deloitte, GRM, single to remove everything except for this current image. But it's not a perfect removal. That's why I can boost my score with this actual input. But like we can... Once we f I find this is predictable by this time and blank information, we can try to remove it on this uh, GRM single. That's one way. Do you think removing it is the right approach, or do you think that that data is factoring into the perceptual representation, and so decoding it is important? Yeah, I think the data itself is interesting. Like it's predictable; it's not noise. But like if we want to have a simplification of this problem, we got to remove it and make an image brain pair. But we can also make another version, like a time series pair with this image and time series of this brain, like the raw boat. That would also be an interesting way, but this makes people harder to get in this. 
Thank you for the great talk. Thank you. All right, let's uh, give one more round of applause for uh, Jose and for everyone else that presented today. I just want to remind everyone that the code and reports are available on the Algonauts uh, Challenge page if you want to dig into that a little bit deeper. I'm um, not only the top three winners, but also um, some other uh, submissions. So now we're going to move into the panel discussion portion of the session. Um, if you, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Welcome everyone to the panel discussion now. You, you saw this beautiful work from these different three teams. Um, and now we're going to have the pleasure to have hopefully three leaders from three different challenges in the community. Radek Chichi and Gemma Roig uh, representing the Algonite project. Fabian Sins representing the Tensorium. And eventually at some point, we hope, you know, I, you know, either in, you know, in spirit or in presence, Martin Schrimm representing the brain score. Um, and those are three cha different channels that have been running since 2019, I believe. Um, they represent different understanding, or they are trying to provide understandings of the brain. Um, they provide they they provide data for the community, as you you know beautifully saw today. But the question is, what is the frontier and what is the upper limit of these challenges? And the question that we are going to try to wrestle today is, you need to poke these people, you know, and try to you know give them ideas for future challenges that will really push the community. So here we are not to be nice, though we are going to ask the question in a nice way. You know, that's important. Um, but just to, you know, provide a new spirit, try to think about, like, what's going to be this panel in 10 years' time? So what are the things that we are needing? And how are we going to structure this? First, I believe um, Fabian is going to give a pitch about the sensory in 2023, uh, three minutes. Hopefully, you know, he's going to convince us that that's the one that we should have all used. Um, then we're going to have Gemma. No, Radek, okay, Radek giving us the one for the Algonauts, and hopefully at some point, Martin. Okay, so the floor is yours. All right, let's take out a few notes. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Lucia. And uh, actually, I would disagree. I would like to be nice. Um, and I'm also not sure whether you should all go to Sensorium. I think Algonauts is also a pretty nice challenge. But in case you're interested in mouse brains, uh, then you might consider the Sensorium challenge. So um, I'm quickly going to tell you about this in the next three minutes and also a little bit why I think challenges like this are very useful. Um, so first about the Sensorium challenge. So we actually have only run the Sensorium Challenge for two years. So last year, and we are running currently one this year. Both of them have been at NeurIPS. Um, so the current Sensorium Challenge is still running for a month. So if you're interested in predicting single neurons for uh, mice brains, you can still join and try your favorite dynamic model. Um, so uh, as I already said, what are the uh, challenges about? The, we, the data we provide is uh, from a mouse uh, primary visual cortex recorded with two photon micro, um, microscopes. That means it's single cell and it's, it's responses to natural images or videos. So last year was images, this year um, it's videos. Um, along with the challenge, we provide data sets, and since I, at least my lab, doesn't record data, so the challenge is hosted together with two other labs, mainly uh, the lab of Andreas Tolias, who is providing the data, and uh, the, another computational lab of Alex Ecker, who, uh, yeah, who helped to organize the challenge. So last year, we uh, published about uh, five data sets with about 28,000 neurons in response to natural images. We had two tracks. One was uh, to predict the responses to static images, just images, and one where we provided the, some behavioral responses too. So like the mouse might be running on a wheel and the mouse might be interested or not, which you can see from the pupil dilation. We've just seen in the, in the current, in the previous talk, that this is, can be very um, important. This year, we provide uh, natural, uh, responses to natural movies of about 38,000 neurons. 
and, uh, and we also give away the, the behavioral responses right away. So it's probably a good idea to use them. Um, in, and since we heard, like actually in the morning and also now, it's important to generalize, to get models and generalize. We also have a bonus track where you can try to predict responses to out of domain stimuli, like classical, as a more classical neuroscience experiments. Like Argonauts, we offer starting kits, um, so you can, um, you can get started quickly. And also we have white papers for each challenge uh, on BioArchive, which you can just access from our web pages. Are my three minutes already over? Okay, I'm going ahead. So um, now a little bit why we are organizing this challenge. And um, so what I'm, I'm saying right now might be controversial or not. I have a hard time predicting this, although I, like, my job is actually predicting brains. Um, <clears throat> but I'm very bad at predicting brains of audiences. Um, all right, so uh, we heard a lot about um, the interaction between computer science and neuroscience um, just now. And I think there are a few lessons, at least for me there are a few lessons that can be learned. And um, uh, I think the, like the one obvious one uh, is that machine learning basically has completely overtaken neuroscience in building intelligent systems, right? And, and I think there's a good reason for this, is that like, neuroscience tries to understand one intelligent system, and machine learning just tries to build an intelligent system. So they are doing engineering, and we are doing reverse engineering in a way, so we always have to do experiments and test it. What's the good thing about engineering is that the development cycle is much, much faster. So they, they basically can just try out stuff and see whether it works. And if it works, it's great. And if it doesn't work, maybe it's just lost in, in bioarchive. In archive. Um, but I think it's a good idea to, to get some of the ingredients that really drove this progress in machine learning and try to get a little bit of that in, in neuroscience as well. And I think challenges have been a great driver of development in machine learning. Why? Because I think they de clearly define what the problem is, so what do we want to solve? As you can, for instance, see by, for the ImageNet challenge. Um, they, they clearly define um, what good looks like, so what, like, what, is a mod what should a model do that we uh, call best model? That might not be the best idea initially, but then you, you have a development cycle, you learn that you actually disregarded something, and then you can come up with a better metric. And uh, they make models comparable on common ground, which I also, uh, also think is very important. And uh, they provide benchmark data. So it's a lot of work to assemble these big data sets to organize these challenges. And then but once they're there, everyone else can use this data to develop their own models. So um, I think it's a great way to, to get good models. And what do, what do we want to do with these models? Um, and uh, that's maybe the second lesson that I take from the, like the interaction between machine learning and neuroscience is that um, if you look at the development of deep learning like since 2012, um, like we've seen that um, we humans may be a little bit bad at building manual features for complex problems. So before 2012, like basically where AlexNet came out, there was a lot of handcrafted features in computer vision and they didn't perform that well. Deep learning came along, they just learned it. And now basically in computer vision, everything um, is deep learning based. And my, like something similar might be the case in neuroscience as well. It's a very complex problem and we, like at least probably the room agrees that a good proxy is to at least learn a model from data that gets as close as possible to what the brain does. What, now we have a complex model, what can we do with it? First of all, I think we can use it to um, test theories, to come up with new interesting experiments, to test these models and experiments and, and verify some of the properties. And also, yeah, to come up, like, uh, to, to come test new experimental ideas that we might have much, much faster than testing them in real brains. And I think one important aspect is also that we can share these models. So everybody can download, at least for Argonauts, now the models. And if you have a good experimental idea, maybe you just run this experimental idea on that model, uh, make a cool prediction, and try to find an experimentalist that can verify them. And either it comes out and it's great, or it doesn't, then we know we, the model has uh, uh, falls short of explaining something. And then we have the next um, idea, how, what to run a challenge on. And, um, uh, what we what we could study in the brain. So with that, I think my three minutes are easily over, and now I give over to Ranek. Thank you. Okay, three minutes. 
Um, can do that. So three reasons why we started Algonaut 219. One is we believe that open science is really important, but it's difficult to implement in the existing system. So the system that we now have is fundamentally built on our communicating and doing science in a not open way. And there are strong incentives to not be open. So you can try to change the system. This is one way that people are taking. The other one is to maybe say, hmm, why don't we just introduce new structures that from the beginning are open, that have openness and transparency built in. And then we thought such challenges that are open prediction chairs are exactly that. The data is open, the goal is transparent, to win you need to share your insights, you not hide them, and the relevant models are open too. So we've reached our goals, and it just comes by itself with lightness. We don't have to impose it, and we don't have to fight against other types of incentives. The second thing for the challenge was organizationally, we believe that it's exactly right for the type of problems that we have in cognitive neuroscience, um, both in size and in clarity. So think about um, problems that are really small and really simple. Then a single person can do that, or a single lab. You don't need to cooperate, just cooperating will just introduce noise. And then there are huge problems, which are, however, very well defined. Then you want to put an institute on that, like map a mouse brain. Clearly defined, huge thing, you need hundreds of people. That's the right way to go. But most problems that we have are not there. They are too big for a single researcher, but they are too small to put up a whole institute. So you need something in between, and you need to orchestrate that um, collaboration. And then we thought a challenge is exactly like this, because many people work towards a common goal without fully committing to an integrated structure. You're not only a cog in a machine, you're not doing one part of the whole thing, but you're contributing to the whole thing in a creative way. Third reason is, and we've heard this very often, I think already from the speakers, is that it's an objective measure. Uh, so if you want to make progress, we must be able to measure it so that we know whether we do it or not. Um, and at the heart of this challenge, because it's a predictive challenge, is one number, and it's in the leaderboard. You might not like the definition of the number, but once we agreed on it, it's there and it's, you, know, you, you can't lie around it. So that we therefore also hope that it has therefore a smaller bias by race, gender, and borders, or publication bias and all of these things, because in principle, many people can assess those uh, challenges and can just win by reaching that number. Now beyond these three reasons, of course, there are many specific challenges or many specific um, decisions that we made. For example, uh, we made sure we don't participate, we don't submit any models. Because it's, you know, as said, it's very important that if you have access to the test data, you don't use it. And it's so hard to make yourself not use it implicitly, explicitly. So that's one thing. Um, we're not on the benchmark, we're not participating. Second, we wanted to be in humans, um, because this is what, what we care about, and, and we have the best data there, I think. No, you might disagree. Um, we wanted it to be integrated, so one data set, not different data sets, like, I don't know, some images, 20 images there, 100 images there. We want the same conditions to make this a, a, an easy comparison, and we want this to be as high quality as we can. So therefore, also, we are so thankful we could team up with NSD, and they held back some of the data because this is arguably right now the best data that we have. And if you're asking yourself, why is not next um, Algonauts again about visual responses, well, we would like a better set, right? We want to develop further, so the next set should be bigger or stronger for testing theories. So my vision for the future of, of this project is that it's not the end, but it's a mere beginning. So by doing those challenges, we learn a lot about how they run and what we can get out of them and, and what pitfalls are and, and, and where people can tweak those things that we could not learn by armchair philosophy. And we invite others to pick up the spirit. You know, once uh, you have this thing running, it's a huge amount to get this running, but once it's running, you can just copy it and, and do it pretty simply in, in, in other contexts. And therefore, it, we you know, invite you to, to also organize and, and um, do these challenges yourself with the goal that we improve our community to be more open, more transparent, and more efficient in solving the problems that are at our heart. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Fabian. Thanks, Radek. I want to ask everyone to give these people a really big round of applause because it takes a lot of time and effort to organize this. And you know, also the people that are behind the, the challenges, and this is something that they do for the community, much like um, you know, Radek pointed out and as well Fabian, we really owe of us all, you know, owe you a lot. So please a big round of applause for these teams that are organizing this.
acknowledging that they are doing a very good service to the community, now the questions are, what is next? And it's clear, at least you know, from me and the, in the outside, that you are providing great data, a very clear challenge, very good metrics. Their objective, you know, everyone can see it in the leaderboard. So in that sense, you were learning to create better models. The question is, for what? And this is what I think that, you know, like you, Fabian, pointed out. Like, are we doing more mod better models for engineering? Are we doing better models for neuroscience? Is there any difference? Um, No, I, I actually, I didn't mean to say that we're building more better models for engineering. I, I wanted to say we take basic an engineering approach to build models that can predict something we are interested in. So, uh, and then what we what we want to predict is basically up to us as a community or like up to the people who organize a, a benchmark competition. Um, but uh, just to basically try to to come up with something that, like, whose main purpose in the beginning is to predict well. And we don't care about whether it has a particular theoretical background or it's maybe even uh, uh, biologically plausible or something, just we want something that, that predicts well. I think that's the first step. And once we have that, then um, it's kind of the most conservative way of looking at this model would be it's an interpolation between all the training data that it has seen. But already that is useful, right? Because now you can start and try to um, simplify the model or uh, t test the theory, um, come up like come up with something interesting and take this as a proxy, uh, in the ideal case, as a proxy um, for the brain. And with that, like basically drive uh, the development. And I think um, we've already, seen, like from the last talk, like, I think we've seen that there is a lot of like, interesting things that come out of this, right? It's, it's a purely predictive model. It's, a, it's an engineering task that you basically solved in the beginning. But from that, we learned that the experimental conditions make a huge difference. And you see traces from, like, the, from the, how you show an image and how you show blanks uh, in the responses, which may be not that surprising, but like, now that we know it, we know basically we have to take into account in the variability in, of brain data. Um, so, um, um, I completely agree that how the challenge is usually set is then later on taken as an engineering process to get the better score because you want to see your name, your name in the first place. Um, but I think also the journey to get there for each individual team, like which individual component contributed and if they make everything available, then we can learn this. There are a lot of sometimes uncomfortable results that can make us think about, so why is this the case, right? Do we need to adjust for noise or is this because of the metric? Or So this is on one thing. The other thing is that since it's open to all the community, then there are a lot of, I think, sometimes very creative ideas that um, particular labs of thinking about a particular question might not even consider and open up like also new venues for taking into account other factors um, and then also comparing the different models. Okay, so what this model has that this other doesn't have to gain this extra percent? Because of course, predictivity is not the same as understanding what's going on, but that there is some relation somehow. Um, so I, I do think that we can learn a lot from this, but um, I do believe that challenges without a leaderboard without a score, then they are not a challenge anymore. And, and this sometimes drives the community to work together. We saw in the talks like, okay, I, I, saw, I saw that I was first, I, I am second. Why is this the case? I want to improve. So in a way it's also engaging, but I also think that from a theoretical perspective afterwards, we, we can learn a lot about um, what these models uh, can, can tell us about the brain. I want to go back and push it.
push you guys a little bit. So I, I, I love the score, and I think that you, know, you had fun. So even that, that, that objective you know, function is already good enough for me. You know, if, we can, if we can have fun during this process, it's, it's good. Um, but now you make a case for once you get that score there and you have your name, um, you take that model and you try to test it with a theory, and then comes the understanding, right? And, and you, know, you mentioned the somehow, and that to me seems like is the somehow that we, you know, what, how, how do we really bridge that gap? And is it there a really sufficient enough solution? Or could we just not run in circles thinking that we are understanding when in fact we are just trying to get a number that is high enough? So I want to make an analogy from computer science. Um, so this is my background. So actually, when there was AlexNet that won the challenge, everyone was, OK, this won the challenge, but the neural networks are not the next thing, right? But it just couldn't be ignored by the community that the error gap was too, too huge to just say this is kind of a random event. So slowly, very fast actually, but in, um, the, the discourse of, of, of the people change of, okay, this is maybe very good engineering effort, but it won't be useful for the future, to, okay, me, maybe we just should see it as a feature extractor, to this is the next thing that we should all focus on. And I think here, I'm not saying it's happening, but there are certain elements that might be incorporated into models that as a community we, we can think but this is unreasonable or this doesn't match any of our theories but then if we see but but really like the predictive gap is very high so why is this the case right we cannot ignore this or is there it, as i said it could be the metric it could be a lot of, of the things but um, this has implications, I think, in all studies that uh, we are doing and analyzing, right? Because some of the methodologies that we are using for the challenge are being used also for analyze uh, uh, data in, in, in different experimental setups uh, for testing hypotheses. Um, so, yes, I mean... Cool, yeah, last addition. Um, taking up on the understanding versus explanation. So, of course, we want a model that is explanatory of neural phenomena. But let's say we had this model and it would be really badly predicting. Would you accept this? You wouldn't, right? What kind of explanation would that be if you have a model that doesn't predict very well? So, one way to get to this is you start with explanation and try to get prediction, or you start with prediction and try to get to explanation. And we're going right now more towards, let's say, we start with the prediction route. Now, what has happened also over the last four years looking at algonauts is that the fields of, of, that deal with this neural data has you know, really improved and grown further together. So now when, for example, Hossein or Jose talk about their results, they say, okay, you know, I observed something in transformers and that actually gave me a funny idea about you know, how different neurons, or how different regions might be talking to each other, which we didn't have previously. So a new idea is born, it can be tested. Or who's the things, okay, you know, we, we, you have to, you just don't try to toss over with brute force by taking X models and just somehow mapping it onto it, but you actually try to engage with it and understand the system, okay, you know, you need a rational mapper on top, what else can you get that makes sense? And by trying out, you find the things that actually make a difference in this model, the things that are important for prediction. So, therefore, I think those challenges are quite relevant in that, in that there can be a melting point or like something like a pressure cooker where a lot of the developments come together. And, and in the GAC this morning, we heard about different data and different metrics and, and tools and theories. And, and, and this is one way to put this together in a small world problem, but you know, big enough to, for many people to engage, where you can make a lot of progress at the same time and generate new ideas. Yeah, maybe my take on this. So um, I think lots of it was already said. I just want to give an example of why I think is actually driving or making accelerating progress in neuroscience. Is um, when so we model a lot of mouse data, and so we we train models to predict V1 um, 
uh, responses of mice, and then we uh, generated stimuli from these networks, that, that what we called MEIs, most exciting images. So we just like did gradient descent on images, try to find images that drive V1 neurons in mouse pretty nicely. So at that time, according to what I know from textbook um, knowledge, I would have expected to find Gabor filters, right? So once we optimized them, they didn't look like Gabor filters, and I thought, okay, deep neural networks have overfitted, probably doesn't work. But then Andrea's lab went ahead and tested them anyway, and it turns out they actually work better than Gabor filters. So that means that in mouse visual cortex, there are things that look like Gabor filters, like asbestos stimuli, but there's also lots of other stuff that looks like maybe like corners or, or something. And I, I would challenge someone to come up with that theory or that idea without actually carefully look, looking at the data or like finding the right data even to show. And I think these models are just very efficient at pulling these effects out of data. And once you have a model, you can just copy it a thousand times on, uh, on different servers and try out different ideas and generate new hypotheses that are then actually not so hard to verify. They are really good tools to search stuff in data and uh, it's like a computer science analogy, finding stuff is difficult, verifying stuff is usually not that hard. So I think this is a great benefit. Yeah. Now shut up, thanks. Yeah, are we allowed to ask questions? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think, you know, I think you make a great case for why challenges are important and helpful in bringing neuroscience forward and I'm totally on board with you guys on that. Um, but I was wondering something I'm sometimes thinking about is in these challenges is like, is there also a risk that we're kind of, in the end, by throwing all the models at it, like we're, we're kind of, you're uh, in the end overfitting or like sort of attaching too much importance to some idiosyncrasies of the data set that turn out to be, in the end, you know, this is eight subjects and the images, there's it's the largest amount of images that we have, but they're sampled in some kind of arbitrary way, right? So. Of course, then there's the next challenge and we do it again, right? But, you know, in the presentation, it came by, the, the out of, you know, the synthetic data set came by and the performance dropped enormously. What do you make of that? Like, how important is the, the generalization to other data sets and the overfitting risk? I can start. I would love to be in a position where we're overfitting so much that we're at a noise ceiling. So we are still very far away from explaining the explainable variance. Once we get there and all models are at ceiling, we can deal with that problem and that will mean, you know, we need stronger constraints. But right now we are fighting at the 60 to 70 percent level. So I'm really not worried that we're there yet. What we might observe is that at some point we're going to get stuck, right? And then you will get some, let's say, unhealthy, maybe battling 0.1, 0.11% increases. But again, I don't think we're there yet. And even if we're there, then this is going to be, then you still have an objective benchmark where you will then know, okay, you, it really needs a new idea. And this benchmark will help you to see the power of a new idea because it will actually break this benchmark. So if someone comes up with a cool idea that, that's revolutionary, it's hard to distinguish it from nonsense, right? It could be great, but it could also be just wrong. And then you have a benchmark which it makes this jump as a DNN did or AlexNet did, then you know that this is the right thing to do. So therefore, I think we're all good now. And you know, we're gonna deal with the luxury problems in 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, I, but I, I actually totally agree with you. I think the the most interesting, uh, or like once we are at the noise ceiling, which is also not the case for mouse, but maybe for V1 we're a bit closer there, is uh, the next interesting question is how well does it generalize? And this is also the reason why we have this bonus track this year, where we basically, you can train models on natural images and then see how, which are basically ecological, but then you can see how well it generalizes to um, uh, to more classical neuroscience paradigms. Because that's actually what we also want from these models, right? Ideally, it would be some kind of uh, common or like, let's say, standard model of neuroscience that you can use to, to test new ideas and for that you need it to, to generalize well. And maybe on a like, very philosophical, higher level view, in the end, like it's all 
brain data, right? It's, it's all different views of the same thing that we try to, each experiment is a different view of the same thing that we try to ex, uh, ex, explain. So ideally we build models that can uh, generalize to new experiments very well and I think this is kind of the far goal, at least what I would be very interested in going. Now we have Martin here. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on that last question because it, it seems to me like to get more explanation, really the focus should be more on the out of distribution, you know, performance. So, you know, I thought one thing that was interesting is when you measured the performance on the out of distribution data, it was just collapsing across a whole range of different kinds of images uh, where, you know, really it would be an interesting to kind of say, okay, the line drawings, let's kind of focus on those particular line drawings. Uh, I don't know if there's enough data for that, but that would be quite informative because it's actually a theoretically relevant form of out of distribution data. It's kind of a, an image that removes texture. It focuses on shape. And so you could say, okay, you know, let's focus on how well the predictions are on line drawings and then also focus on the different levels of, you know, the low to the high because the way it's described now, we got these numbers but, you know, it may well be, and I don't know, but performance would be far worse than half. It might be, you know, if you just look, just focusing on the line drawings and looking at IT or the highest level of the architecture, the performance might be, you know, 5% or something like that. And that would be very informative to understand how well these models are working. So I think, you know, I think sometimes these high numbers are kind of misleading in terms of the degree of overlap and the degree of explanation you've achieved because it's really out of distribution data that will be informative and, and by kind of just collapsing across, you know, TV static and line drawings and edges. I mean, it's really under, you know, you're underplaying the importance of focusing on that out of distribution data and focusing on particularly ones that are theoretically relevant, like line drawings, for instance. So I just want to pick up on that point. Hey, uh, sorry for being late and sorry if I'm repeating points that I've made before, uh, but for, for your specific, Question, uh, we have some new data on that that is unpublished. But we're recording uh, prime IT data in response to line drawings, shapes, uh, cartoons, a bunch of different of distribution data sets. Uh, w one result from that is that IT itself seems to be extremely general. So you can fit a linear decoder on IT representations in response to naturalistic images. And that, without any further training, will generalize to cartoons, line drawings, and so forth. So the primate brain seems to be really good at this. If you do the same thing on models, it works less well, but it's not not much worse than uh, what we already see in the on the naturalistic data. So models still explain maybe about half the data, uh, but then generally is worse. Okay, yeah, it'd be interesting to see that. No. Yeah, just a, a small addition. So it was actually a, a choice what to do with the hidden data set. So we did have these more. Uh, cognitive-driven data sets like uh, the gavors and the noise and so on, um, just to test this generalization, uh, because we believe that if we had just uh, put this out from the beginning, then maybe there would be more effort, and maybe this would have been the, the right thing to do, to say that there will be some hidden data set that will test non-realistic images, so you should take this into account, but this was a, a choice we made and, and maybe it was not the right one um, because then of course it drove people to optimize for the score that they had without taking this into account but but now we know so there are still some predictivity it's it's okay but the gap is huge right so okay maybe next step what can we do to close this gap so, so definitely food for thought so Um, so, so I, of course, I take the comment. Um, I like it. So, but it defines the research direction. So, basically, it means yes, we all agree now that out of distribution tests are very important. So, the next test set, whatever it's going to be, should, if we just can, have this and have very strong and diverse out of distribution tests, right? But this is then something we recognize and we can now implement. So that that's great. So that's an insight, and we can. Hopefully, somehow, if we get the money and how, you know, whatever, and all the things that you need in science, we can do this. Um, and the other one, as Gemma said, I think it's very important at some point to create a critical mass. And something like 100 people 
really interacting with something uh, that we had in this challenge, downloading things, looking at videos, really submitting. This is a lot of effort. And then we want to keep the threshold low in the beginning so that more people come in, this becomes more interesting, and the more people pay attention to it, the more maybe this will be recognized, we hope. This is, of course, up to the field, right? They can also just say, you know, we don't, we don't care. Or they can say, this is important, we value this. Um, and then people will be, again, more motivated, and we can then also put more effort on people. Like, yes, you will have another date where you will have to submit another set of brain responses. But that's like a next step. Um, once people are willing to say, okay, we are willing to start at all. Because this is not something that is usually done. This is something that has just started. There, are, there have been very, very few challenges in cognitive neuroscience, and we would like it to be a lot more. I love the, the vision of, uh, of all of this, of this workshop, and what you talked about, the open science vision, and the, the combination of having uh, test sets that are not uh, publicly available in order to keep us honest as a community, and also so the subtle balance between competitive motivation but ultimately leading to collaboration. You know, it's, it's extremely inspiring, and uh, I think uh, a main problem, major problem is that this two-hour session is much too short, and you know, really these 15-minute talks totally scratch the surface, right? I mean, we, we cannot understand the models in detail. There is, uh, I think, major insights along the way about uh, the nature of the data, these temporal dependencies. You know, my bet is that they're artifactual due to the way that we estimate the trial responses. Um, that's an important methodological insight, right? Um, there's perhaps, uh, you know, if we just wanted to focus on you know, straight up uh, visual encoding models, we should keep the uh, stimulus order secret. You know, maybe that would be a better challenge. On the other hand, because it wasn't, uh, we're now perhaps finding out either about something really exciting about the brain or about a, a methodological challenge with estimating the trial responses. This is just one example of things that deserve much more time somehow. I feel like there should be an event in between, you know, I mean, if you have this two-year cycle, maybe there should be something like a workshop, like a, a two-day workshop or something where, where all these things can really be discussed in depth and where also collaborations can start around the Algonauts uh, challenges, right? So that the Algonauts challenge is not just a challenge where you win and then you go home and you're happy about winning, but it sort of like jump starts collaborations in, in the field of, you know, multi-lab uh, groups that really tackle the questions that we're interested in. I'm not sure what to answer to this, except that I fully agree. I think so a lot. Uh, uh, one tiny addition is, I think, for such a workshop, which I think is a great idea, it would be good to have both the machine learning or like the engineers uh, on board, but also the experimentalists, because I think, I mean, or maybe this is what you had in mind, these are the kind of interesting interactions, because uh, like you have a model, maybe it makes interesting predictions, you're a computer scientist, you don't know what it means, but then on the other hand, you have an experienced experimentalist who can tell you this is an artifact or you should pre-process your data differently or this is actually something interesting that we can test. I think it's a great idea and I also think it's hard to organize and structure. Um, but if you have ideas and you want to be on board also. <laughs> Just out of the blue now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because I... Of course, I mean, the aim is at this multidisciplinary interaction and uh, sometimes it's just, okay, one computer science lab, one more neuroscience lab working independently and now how we, we can bring together beyond this number. That's the next step. Yeah, so totally happy to take you up on that. We can do that, invite people, and then I'll say, okay, this is what we learned, and what are the lessons for the next challenge? How are we going to gather structure? Because right now, I think there are three groups, and they kind of on their own decide what they want to do, the metrics and everything else. And this is, of course, not a participatory process, right? It's not always any, any time one single person, it's always teams. 
but those teams could also very much benefit from others. And we are more than, than happy to listen and discuss this with others and then draw it. So yes, that would be something where we say, okay, what did we learn from not maybe one challenge, but all three? What are our insights? Where, are the, um, where did we find problems? Where did people try to cheat? Where is there um, uh, unclarity, whether that's a real effect or an artifact? And then how do we deal with that? What's the course we defined it and then go in that direction, yeah? So, but I think it should go beyond that, right, as well? Um, well, I, I, that's what I got from his comment. Uh, not only, so I think there is one part, uh, which I completely, I mean, we talk a lot about Algonauts, of course, uh, which is like how to organize challenge, what uh, are the difficulties, which considerations we should take into account, and they both have a lot of experience uh, and, Hopefully they can share also what what they have learned. And the other thing is like, so how can we bring the community together after the challenge, right? Yeah. And well, I, I guess that's what I got from your question. Maybe I misinterpret. So sorry if this is the case. But kind of like continuing this collaboration, but really closely together. That could also be implemented, for example, yeah, that's great ideas, right? I mean, that's interesting problems to think about. It could be a stratified data set where you say there is X percent of data that you release for the first challenge, there's a hidden set for the first, but there is more hidden data for the second and more for the third with increasing difficulty. So there's also a build up and a curriculum learning kind of thing happening. So that might be an option that might go and might, might connect those. I think one way to get a lot of hidden data would be to do better at engaging the experimentalists, because right now I think most of the data come from people that are sort of do this out of the goodness of their hearts. They're like, they have the data, they, they give it to us modelers, and uh, we love that, of course, but I think we could do a lot better to really, really showcase how the models can be useful in designing future experiments. Uh, and then maybe also finding ways, like, for instance, one, one data could be, in addition to a modeling challenge, we could also have something like a, a benchmark challenge. Can you find data or some, some benchmark that really shows where the models fail, or such that you can maximally tease them apart? Uh, so yeah, in turn, I think engaging with the experimental community much more strongly would, would really help us as a, as a modeling field, too. I think this has been a, a really great workshop, and I, I'm uh, really impressed by the whole uh, endeavor and idea of the, the kind of uh, challenge um, framework. Uh, I guess my question can, comes as somebody who's more interested in the front of a brain than the back of a brain. Uh, and uh, my question is really about uh, moving from uh, challenges involving perception to challenges involving cognition and action. Whether the panel see that as being a particularly difficult problem because of the diversity of potential questions and tasks that you, you might want, that the community might want to ask, whether they think that there are existing data sets that would already form excellent challenge data sets, or whether, uh, uh, whether there are particular problems that they might, might um, foresee if, if, if we wanted to, to set up the same challenge framework, but do it for something like decision making or planning, any number of different cognitive tasks. I can maybe say some things because we, we've recently tried to uh, expand brain score from just vision to soon also include language. And I think like a lot of the things transfer. So like, you can use a lot of the same metrics, a lot of the, the same infrastructure, code libraries, all of that is great. The main difficulty we encountered was that this interaction point between models and, and data, to clearly define that on a conceptual level where it makes sense for both sides, I think that was really uh, quite a struggle and maybe still is. So. Yeah, making clear how exactly you want to interact with models and how models interact with data and vice versa, that, that I think is the, the main challenge in moving to other domains. You can, yeah. yeah, I'm like, I'm just only like a maybe uninformed comment because I'm, I'm working on the back of the brain, not the front. Um, but what I, like what gets me excited like uh, is that at the moment we, we see a lot of like, um, methods development in like a lot of fronts, right? There's experimental techniques get better, we can record more data, but on the other hand, um, machine learning or the entire machine learning models, the entire computer vision infrastructure also gets a lot better. And I feel that um, maybe interesting data uh, in that direction could come from 
people or even animals, as we have seen this morning, playing computer games, for instance. I think those have very, like many like interesting aspects, like visual search, uh, decision making, planning, and so on. And putting people into a, like a simple game situation or even a virtual environment, I think, uh, is something that's tractable and would be very interesting. Thanks for organizing the, um, yeah, the challenge uh, and this uh, panel is very interesting. Um, so, in a common complaint in, from people working in machine learning and maybe doing more um, kind of theoretical or novel work is that often they submit work to conferences and the reviewers go, yeah, but can you show us ImageNet? Um, so basically, the field has kind of collapsed a bit onto this um, metric. So I don't see that happening anytime soon in cognitive science or neuroscience. Um, but just as a half joke, have you thought about this, um, this possible risk, like in introducing something like that, that you might end up with such a situation? <laughs> uh, we, we have thought about that. I, I would say in machine learning, there is a bit too much focus on that. And in cognitive neuroscience, there is too little focus on that. So I think right, right now we should push the needle a bit more towards doing more of these empirical evaluations. Uh, I would also say one, difficulty in machine learning for a long time has been that people have been hyper-focused on ImageNet alone, right? Like, it's been this one benchmark, it's been standing, and for many years that was the only thing that people uh, worked on. Uh, I would say now, in, in vision as well as language, there is much more focus on new benchmarks. Like, people are investing much more energy on trying to see once a benchmark has been approximately completed, they, they move on to the next thing. So there's much more dynamics in there, which I think is something we as a community can also learn. So let's not just stay focused on one data set, but rather let's keep moving the, the goalposts. Just very quickly. Um, so I think that definitely we are not uh, there yet in this community. And also the, um, the how the science is driven. So, especially, so maybe in theoretical machine learning is not the case and they have their own venues in which they appreciate the, the new algorithms and the mathematical proofs and so on. But there is a lot that is task driven. So they do care about performance because that's their end goal, right? Whereas here, that's not the end goal. It's a means, right, to evaluate. The danger is that it could become, but we shouldn't lose focus. And it's one I don't, goal. it's one goal, yeah, yeah. But um, I don't think for the, for the challenge it could be the the only goal. But as a community, I don't think it will ever be. I think, um, and 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 I completely agree. Like, uh, so we shouldn't get stuck with this one data set with this one metric all the time. So it should be an evolving thing, right? And I think this is important. Last yeah. question. Oh. Yes. So, so to repeat um, a prior comment. So if, if a reviewer asks you to please fit your model and show this on Algonauts, give me a call and I'm going to celebrate. <laughs> um, but what I see recently happening is that people start citing this data and citing other data that we did, where they don't only look at one data set, but they say, okay, we did this with Bold 5000, NSD, Algonauts, Things, One, EEG, MEG, la, 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 la. So we already have six, seven, or eight different data sets on which they, they are doing this, and this number will rather grow. So I would rather expect the field at some point that these things become simple because the threshold to fit this just becomes, you know, it's becoming part of your education. Every PhD student can do this. There is X standard data sets and you're going to have a table which is going to say, you know, also on Martin's data, how well are you doing? And then we have a nice table which actually quantitatively gives you um, the success of your model. Uh, so thank you. Uh I wanted to highlight one dimension that seems to be missing from this community, which is learning. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems that there's often a, a disconnect between deep learning models and how fast they learn compared to how we learn. Um, so do you know of any endeavor in that direction or are you thinking about that? Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah. 
so I will repeat quickly the question. So the question is if there is an interaction in learning, model learning, I guess. Yeah, between model learning, learning and, and you know, human, human learning, learning yeah. and not only at the end state of the model. And so I know that there are some efforts also in connecting like machine learning models to developmental psychology. I am trying to go there a little bit, and I think here in the panel we also have people interested in the development uh, side from the cognitive uh, science perspective. And it, it is also a matter of, so if it's starting, like how can we test this kind of different learnings, right? And um, is, is how we learn and the task that we have, is this important? So if we have a common benchmark, then we could test that. Um, so I think, I mean, learning is definitely a very interesting dimension. It's just so hard to get uh, to experimentally get at it. I mean, how do you measure learning in the brain? Um, and like the, let's say, on a single neuron level, um, uh, there might be fancier methods now, but like one, a very established one was to poke two cells and then have a very specific protocol how you stimulate them to get some synaptic change. And I almost can guarantee you that whatever learning rule you get out of this won't ever give you something that generalizes well and predicts brain data. So it's a huge challenge and I, I would see that rather um, on the horizon, um, but otherwise I agree that's interesting. I just want to make a remark because I realized, uh, so I didn't, when um, in my reply, I didn't mean in the alg algorithmic part and see, but more on longitudinal studies, like how kids learn and, and how these representations that are built over time really interferes how an adult representation is, for instance. Uh, but th there are a lot of factors uh, and a, a lot of other parameters that one could take into account. Because we're at the hour, we're going to have one last question and then the session is over with a big round of applause. So many thoughts. I hope there is some online forum that will continue to be open so that all these things can be discussed further and people who want to organize something step in and you know contribute to the community maybe by organizing a workshop or something can, can uh, suggest something. Uh, and then one thought that's on my mind is you know, one benchmark is clearly better than zero benchmarks and a thousand benchmarks are better than one. Maybe there can also be multiple benchmarks in a single competition and then the winners can be anyone on the Pareto front or something like that. Uh, and I hope that these challenges will also keep being available online. Um, so, you know, so it's sort of like a historical record and an incrementally growing uh, set uh, where the models can just, you know, some will be exhausted at some point because uh, there's concern about overfitting, but they're still useful. And uh, these websites should not be taken down, but rather integrated into something bigger. It's super inspiring what, what you guys are doing. So I think all challenges here is the standard keep the challenge benchmarks open after the challenge is done. After this beautiful remark and also an invitation to the community to participate in what these guys are doing, because this, as, as you just said, you know, you all thank them for their big, big, big efforts. This can also be improved with your help. I think this is a big, big ask to everyone here and beyond to participate in what they just kick started. And with that, just let's thank them for their great efforts and hopefully for keeping the benchmarks out and creating a next community. So thank you guys.